Okay. Good. Good evening, everybody. Um, I, I think we're live. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties and uh, really appreciate uh, everybody's patience here. I appreciate the sponsors and really appreciate, of course, our patients. Um, we um, are here from Fox Chase Cancer Center. This is a together facing bladder and kidney cancer event. Um, my name is Dan Guinesman. I will be the moderator uh, tonight. I'm one of the GU medical oncologists here, and I've been here for a little over uh, seven years. Really proud to be part of this uh, amazing team. Um, we're going to try to share some of our thoughts about kidney cancer, about bladder cancer, about some of the latest research, and uh, about some of the common questions uh, that always come up uh, that are important to all of us, and, and uh, kind of share with you how we think about it. Okay. Um, feel free to leave questions if you're able to, uh, text questions, email us questions, uh, and we'll be happy to get back to you, even if we can't do it in true life format. Um, I think even though this is recorded now, we traditionally begin these events by honoring those that we have lost to cancer. So um, we will pause here for about 10 seconds of silence for that. Good, thank you. And, and obviously we'd love to do this live. This is special times, this is COVID times, and uh, we really look forward to seeing you guys all in person at Fox Chase in the near future for an event like this, okay? So uh, I also wanna really uh, thank our exhibitors. We've talked to them a little bit earlier, but I wanna, I wanna thank them again. Uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, Keras Foundation Medicine, Genentech, Garden, Natera, Oncoset, Tempus, and Urogen, who are our gold exhibitors and our silver exhibitors, ESI, Exelixa, Sanofi, and Seattle Genetics. And a big thank you to BCAN, uh, which is a wonderful national organization for bladder cancer that does a lot of advocacy and research uh, in bladder cancer for being part of this as well. So without further ado, I really would like to go around and um, introduce uh, the panel. And um, I, I would ask each panelist to say hello, uh, say a little bit about themselves, about um, Fox Chase and anything else they'd like to share, whether it's something personal or something in regards to their research. So uh, let, let's start with Dr. Uzo. Um, Dr. Rizzo, would you like to say hello? Thank you, Dan. My name is Robert Uzo. I'm the Department of Surgery uh, Chair. Uh, I've been at Fox Chase for uh, almost two decades. Um, I have stayed here because of the work we do, the progress we make, and the people that I work with. Um, it's been a privilege to take care of patients with urological malignancies. I spend most of my time thinking and caring for patients with kidney cancer and urothelial cancer. That's mostly bladder cancer that can also be formed up in the uh, kidneys as well. Um, we we uh, really take that responsibility incredibly seriously. Um, we call each other, we're friends with each other, we rely on each other as physicians that approach these problems in many different ways. And uh, one of the more, um, um, one of the best aspects of being here is the ability to just pick up the phone and talk to anybody on this panel at the drop of a hat and ask them some of their ideas and think through a person's problem together. And I think that uh, there's been great progress, uh, but it really requires minds like the people here. So thank you and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Horowitz, um, would you like to say hello? Thanks, Dan. It also is a, um, it's a privilege to be here and it, it is the way uh, Rob said it, like to work with you guys and to work with this group, it's a special thing. And it's one of the reasons that I think makes us so strong. Uh, I've been a Fox Chase. I probably in this panelist I'm panel, I'm the one who's been here the longest for, I think this is now my 23rd, 24th year at Fox Chase. And there's a reason I've stayed. Again, it's to work with experts uh, in, in, in this field. I specialize in the treatment of prostate cancer and uh, bladder cancer. Um, and uh, again, appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you tonight. Thank you. Dr. Kudikoff. Yeah, thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, so my name is Alex Kudikoff. I am the chief of one of the divisions of surgery, which is urologic oncology. Um, I trained in Philadelphia after doing my medical school in Boston. I came to Philadelphia and have stayed. And this is uh, now I'm in my 13th year at Fox Chase. And uh, 
like both uh, Rob and Eric uh, said, this is a really special place. This is a place where every patient is treated as an individual, um, everybody, every physician, every nurse, um, everyone that works in this hospital takes enormous ownership of every patient outcome and takes immense pride in the way uh, our patients do and uh, takes everything very personally if uh, they ever have setbacks. And I think that really what sets Fox Chase apart, it's a, it's a small institution, but it really competes with um, some of the biggest um, uh, names in oncology in the country. And the reason why is because the care that we deliver here um, is I think very, very special. I, I can't imagine working anywhere else. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Zibelman. Thanks. So um, my name is Matt Zibelman. I'm a GU medical oncologist at Fox Chase. Um, I did my training uh, here and was fortunate enough to stay on. I've been on faculty now for five years. Um, it's just a, um, a tremendous honor to be able to, to work here. Um, I specialize in, in mostly prostate, bladder, and kidney cancers. Um, and I also uh, conduct research um, primarily with immunotherapy, which are drugs that we use um, to help treat our, um, some of our patients, um, some patients that may be listening today who have benefited from these therapies. Um, so it's, it's just a wonderful to work with the great colleagues I have here. Um, we often talk about the experience of Fox Chase and the Fox Chasiness of it. And I just think that just somehow encompasses the, the great environment that, that we all are able to work in and, and interact with our patients with. So thank you all for uh, listening in today. Wonderful. Dr. Hallman. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Hallman. Um, I have a privilege of being one of the radiation oncologists at Fox Chase Cancer Center. Um, I also specialize in prostate and, and bladder cancers. And I just want to echo what you've probably already heard um, from the others here that I, I think this is a world class center. I've been here for 10 years now. Four of those were the first four years were, were receiving excellent training and I'm glad to be able to pass that on to our residents here. But uh, I think uh, this is just a world-class cancer center, but you know, on top of that, I think it, you, you just receive personable care um, from a team that really cares about you and, and uh, really wants the best for you. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Dr. Correa. Oh, hi, my name is Andres Correa. I'm one of the newest members of the team. I did my fellowship here about two years ago. And um, I was uh, lucky to be able to come back and work with this phenomenal team. Uh, very fortunate to be here. Uh, one of the reasons I came to Fox Chase is because of multiple of the members in this panel today, among others. So Fox Chase, as everybody has said, is a very special place. It's a phenomenal place for patients. People take care of their patients like their family members here. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to come back. So uh, thank you for having me and pleasure to be back. Thank you, yeah, absolutely. Dr. Gatalia. Hmm. You're on mute. Hi, my name is Pooja Gatalia. I'm a medical oncologist. I trained at Fox Chase as well. And uh, one of the main reasons I decided to stay at Fox Chase is because I realized that this is a place where patients are really cared for. And there is a, re uh, a great interaction between the different specialties to, to uh, make the patient uh, have the first priority. Um, I focus on research in uh, kidney and bladder cancer um, around response to uh, certain types of med drugs like immunotherapy. Um, and I personally feel that it's a privilege to take care of patients with cancer. And uh, I plan to go over and above beyond to take care of you. Thank you, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and last but not least, Dr. Anari. Hi, thank you for having me tonight. My name is Fern Inari. I'm one of the GU medical oncologists. I am the newest one to the group. Um, I also did my training at Fox Chase and I thought that the care that our patients received and the multidisciplinary approach to each um, patient was really second to none. So it was a very easy decision for me to make when it came to um, picking a job after graduation. I was very lucky to stay at Fox Chase um, and work with all of these wonderful people. Thank you. Great, great. So, um, you know, I, I think what we should do now is uh, start talking uh, about kidney and bladder cancer. And I'm going to ask uh, some of you some questions and we'll kind of see how the discussion evolves. 
uh, we will hopefully have some questions from our patients and try to weave those in um, and uh, kind of see where the conversation takes us, okay? So um, let's, let's start um, with you, Dr. Correa, and, and I, I would ask, you know, the answers be somewhat to the point so we can get through as many as we can and get to some of our patient questions as well. But tell me, uh, what exactly is a renal mass? Uh, is a renal mass always cancer? Uh, are cis masses? Um, and how do you how do you think about that when you see a patient uh, for the first time who comes to you with, with those questions? Yeah, thank you, Dan. So technically, yeah, both solid renal masses and cysts are both considered masses of the kidney. I think that some good differentiation here is that people will develop cysts in their kidneys at their age, and that's completely normal. Having a solid mass in the kidney is not as normal as having a cyst, but that doesn't mean that they're all malignant. And so here's where the size of the mass really matters. So if you have a mass that's less than three centimeters, that still means that the mass only has the potential, has still the potential to be benign about 30% of the time. Now, as the mass gets bigger, then the risk of cancer does go, those, those become more, uh, the risk of cancer increases. So that's important to know. Now for cysts, it's a little bit different. So the size of the cyst is not as important actually what the cyst looks like on imaging. So we talk about cyst complexity or how the cyst looks on the CT scan on the MRI. So that's something for patients to know that the size of the cyst is not the most important thing, it's how the cyst looks. But for solid masses, the mass, the, cyst, the, the size of the mass is really important. Thank you. So, so, so cysts and masses on the kidney, um, how do we deal with those, Dr. Ruzzo? I mean, I've heard about, you know, there's radical nephrectomy, there's partial nephrectomy, there's ablation. Uh, how do you think about those modalities in relation to kidney masses and kidney cysts? Well, the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that it really is a, got a high probability of being cancer. And you get a lot of clues on a CAT scan or an MRI. PET scans, interestingly, don't work that much. Patients ask a lot about those, but they really aren't so specific for kidney cancer. So you have to have a CAT scan and MRI done properly. And you've got to be localized. Once, you're, you know, once we can assure that the tumor isn't outside the kidney or you know, in other locations, then we start talking about surgical management. And so when we talk about it, you can do surgery, that is remove the whole kidney or piece of it. You can do ablation, which is where you freeze or you can superheat the tumor and kill it that way. Or in some cases, if it's small and it's you know, growing slowly, which we'll is watch it, just like with low risk prostate cancer. And those decisions can be very complicated um, because they have to be balanced in terms of the patient's overall health, their kidney function. It becomes very uh, sort of you know, very nuanced and very personalized. Um, but most importantly, what I think people need to know is that all these are options. And if they go you know, to a place you know, where people are familiar with these options and do them frequently, then of course, you, know, you can select the best one as opposed to the one that someone feels most comfortable with um, you know, in, in your care. Great. So, so let, let me ask you, Dr. Kudakov, uh, we mentioned about being sure about sort of the localization of the mass and that it's not spread. Uh, do you ever use biopsies in, in kidney lesions? And how do you think about that? And are you ever worried about this spreading the cancer, for example? We, we, hear, we hear that uh, not infrequently. Yeah, so great question. Uh, biopsies are, is quite an important tool in management of kidney cancer. Um, biopsy is terrific at differentiating or telling apart benign masses from malignant masses. Um, biopsy is not very good at telling us if the mass is malignant, how aggressive it is. Um, and so for some patients, a biopsy makes a big difference. And for some patients, um, it does not. And again, just like what Dr. Ruzzo said, these, some of this decision-making and some of the scenar clinical scenarios that come up is, is very, very nuanced. So it's very important to just discuss that with your physician. But the main point to make is that biopsy is safe. Biopsy has about one to 2% chance of um, a controlled uh, and very manageable uh, risk of bleeding from a biopsy. But as far as, as, far as um, things like spreading the tumor, um, the, the risk of that is incredibly small. Is it zero? It's not zero, but it's incredibly small. And what I tell patients that every time somebody elects to go to surgery, their chance of not making it through is quoted as around two and a 
two in a thousand, okay? Chances of a biopsy spreading tumor is much, much less. And so when you're weighing those decisions as going forward to, with surgery without a biopsy or potentially having a biopsy and walking away from surgery um, because the mass is benign, the calculus is quite simple. A biopsy is a very informative tool that can change management. Great, thank you. And, and as we're discussing this, there's a question uh, that has come up uh, from a patient and, and, and they note that there was a small fatty cyst found on, on my kidney and an ultrasound uh, has been ordered to monitor the size of this. They have a history of other cancers as well. Do you recommend them seeing a specialist for this? Is this something um, that they should see a urologist anywhere for? Is this something you know to go to a cancer center for? Uh, sort of a smaller fatty cyst uh, on the kidney, and, and and what's the differential diagnosis? What do we think about with that? Uh, and, and you know, either Dr. Korea, Dr. Kudakov, Dr. Uzo, any thoughts on that? Maybe just I'm unmuted. Maybe I'll take it. Um, so a a, fat, a fatty cyst is you know something that we really need to understand a little bit better. Cysts are really collections of fluid uh, that don't have any solid components, that don't have any blood flow in them. Uh, whereas uh, a, a tumor that contains fat is, a, is something a little bit different. When we hear about tumors that contain fat, we think about uh, lesions that are called angiomyolipomas, which are completely benign, but they can uh, have a spon have a have a bleed uh, sort of a, they have a risk of bleeding uh, at a certain size. So whenever somebody has a um, a tumor on their kidney that's anything other than a simple cyst. Um, it's worth seeing a specialist, um, a, a urologist, uh, general, you know, in the community can generally advise you uh, about what to do. Um, clearly, something like surgery, clearly something, uh, you know, decisions about biopsies, active surveillance, it's always good to see um, a specialist who, you know, uh, sees uh, lots of patients with kidney cancer and can sort of walk you through the details of uh, a particular situation. Great. And, and, you know, you, since you, you all are experts and, and, and see this all the time, let's throw a curveball. Let's, let's make a really kind of a U-turn here. Um, there's a question that, that came up, uh, and, and a mother uh, of someone here has just been diagnosed with muscle invasive bladder cancer, has some squamous differentiation, maybe fully squamous. It's T2, meaning it's pushing into the muscle uh, of the bladder. And they're wondering if there are any treatment that could be recommended to spare her bladder. Um, she, she's 88 years old. Um, and, and so, Dr. Holman, when we talk about muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer, um, especially in individuals who are a little bit older, uh, is there a role for radiation in that at all? Yeah, so, so radiation uh, combined with chemotherapy is a, a good form of bladder preservation. If a patient has a, a good functioning bladder, and particularly if they're, they're not a good surgical candidate or they want to avoid surgery, um, radiation can offer them a curative treatment that, that works quite well. And, and uh, Dr. Dr. Anari, you mentioned chemotherapy together with radiation. Do you use chemotherapy um, for bladder cancer? And sort of in, in what instances do you, do, you, do you use chemotherapy? We use chemotherapy in a few different ways with bladder cancer. Um, we use it in the neoadjuvant sense, which means given before surgery. So if someone has a muscle invasive bladder cancer, then we'll give a few cycles of chemotherapy before surgery with the hopes of shrinking the tumor down. We also use chemotherapy in conjunction with radiation, like Dr. Hallman mentioned. Uh, the chemotherapies differ a little bit um, in how we give them. So depending on um, each individual, we, we choose a certain uh, chemo regimen. Makes sense. Um, Dr. Dr. Korea, uh, bless you. Um, let me ask you a question. I, and, I, and I think either Dr. Kudukov or Dr. Ruzu brought this up, this idea that uh, bladder cancer, we call maybe urothelial carcinoma, can occur not just in the bladder, but even in the higher parts up in the kidney. Uh, what, what's the difference between that when we hear the term urothelial carcinoma versus bladder cancer versus upper tract urothelial carcinoma? How, how is that different? And how do we think about that differently? Yeah, again, thank you. That's a very good question. So just, I tell my patients all the time that just the way that we develop the cells in the bladder go the way up to 
whatever collects the urine or touches the urine that doesn't make it has your ethereal cells. So some sense, everywhere that is not in the middle of the kidney will form some type of what we call your ethereal carcinoma. Now, the tricky part about the ethereal carcinoma in the kidney is that it can be a little bit harder to stage and harder to figure out what, at what stage it is because of the little, the little instruments that we have to put up there to be able to, be able to diagnose that cancer. So we based our diagnosis mostly on imaging versus in the bladder, we based our diagnosis mostly on the resections that we take. So I think there's a difference there. Also the treatment. So in a way that most of the high grade tumors that are in the bladder that um, are not invasive, they get treated with just bladder preservation techniques. But in the kidney, we tend to be more aggressive just because of the fact that for those patients, it's harder to truly stage them. So for them, we recommend more radical treatments and in some patients, um, some chemotherapy. Hmm. Um, Dr. Zibelman, you've mentioned before that one of your interests is immunotherapy, um, and we've talked about bladder cancer a little bit, we've talked about kidney cancer a little bit. Um, is, is there a role for immunotherapy in either one of those, and uh, uh, when, when, when are we thinking about using that, and, and do we use it early on in the disease? Um, sort of around the surgical period, either before or after. Sure. So, um, so we we do use immunotherapy in kidney cancers and bladder cancers. And when I say immunotherapy, these are drugs that we give, which attempt to try to get patients' own immune system or own immune cells to recognize and attack the cancer. And part of what's going on in cancer is that there's a mismatch with that approach, and the cancers are finding ways to avoid the immune system. And so we use these drugs nowadays to try to get the immune cells to recognize the cancer again. Um, right now, we use these drugs in patients that have what we call metastatic bladder or kidney cancer, so where the cancer um, has spread to other parts of the body. Um, in some instances, we use these drugs in combination with other therapies for both cancers. And sometimes um, we'll use them alone. Um, at this point, um, we're not using them for earlier stages of the disease when the cancer is localized, but there's a lot of research looking into um, using these drugs um, at earlier stages, either um, either before surgery or after surgery as a way to treat the disease or prevent it from recurring. And so, um, and then there's also a lot of research going on at Fox Chase looking at this that, that we're all involved in and trying to find better um, ways to use these drugs, better ways to predict which patients are most likely to benefit from these drugs and better ways to combine them to um, improve how patients respond. Yeah. Um, Dr. Dr. Gattalia, um, you know, we talk a lot about clinical trials at Fox Chase. Um, are there any that stand out to you uh, or that you're involved with uh, either in bladder cancer or, or kidney cancer or trials that maybe are coming on the horizon that uh, folks should know about? Yeah, absolutely. Um... No, you're muted, Dr. Gattalia. Uh, so at Fox Chase, uh, we have a clinical trial uh, that is going to come up uh, very shortly within uh, hopefully the end of this year. Uh, and the clinical trial is uh, focused at patients with bladder cancer uh, with the hope of uh, uh, saving the bladders of uh, some of the patients who have a very good response to the treatment. And the treatment that is given is a combination of chemotherapy with immunotherapy. Um, uh, we are very excited about that clinical trial um, and hopefully we'll have that option available soon. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have several other clinical trials at, at Fox Chase, um, uh, including a clinical trial in kidney cancer where uh, patients uh, receive uh, immunotherapy uh, when they have cancer localized to their kidney. Uh, they receive immunotherapy before and after uh, having their tumors taken out, uh, which is another very interesting clinical trial uh, that's ongoing. Great. Uh, Dr. Ruzo, there, there's a question that uh, came up that I think is very relevant, um, not even just to kidney cancer, really to cancer in general, but it's really about uh, kidney tumors. And the question is, are they hereditary? Can they be hereditary? And um, should family members be tested somehow if I'm diagnosed with kidney cancer? Um, how do you counsel patients regarding that? Do we have services like that at Fox Chase? And, and sort of just how do you think through this question of hereditary kidney cancer? So um, 
you need to sort of understand the difference between hereditary and genetic and patients often make a, you know, make a logical, you know, assumption that they're the same. Hereditary means that you had a mutation in your family line, in your mom or your dad, and you inherited it and it put you at a higher risk for developing kidney cancer. And so there are those kinds of mutations, just like the breast cancer gene that predisposes family members to breast cancer, the BRCA1 gene. There are at least four of those types of genes, but they're very rare. Less than five or seven percent of all kidney cancers are inherited that way. Um, when we uh, start to think about it, it's because somebody has multiple tumors on both kidneys at a young age. And then we start thinking that that might be a hereditary syndrome. But the vast majority of, um, of kidney tumors aren't hereditary, they're genetic, meaning that the tumor, the cells in the tumor have mutations, but they're not located anywhere else in the body. Those mutations are not in other organs, and therefore you can't pass them down with sperm or or, 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 um, uh, or ovarian follicles, because they're only located in the tumor, and therefore that's not generally considered to be hereditary. So the practical answer to your question, Dan, is if you've got a strong family history, or if someone's gotten a tumor in both of their kidneys at a young age, or in multiple occasions of their tumor, we start doing genetic testing and counseling. And yes, we have a very, very, very well-known service for that, where they do a lot of fancy you know, a detective work and, and genetic testing. But for the vast majority of people, that's not the case. Thank you, yeah. So, so, so let me shift gears a little bit. Dr. Horowitz, uh, is there any role for radiation in kidney cancer? I, I've sort of heard that traditionally radiation is not something that's utilized, um, but, but do, do you find that, that it's ever helpful in, in treating kidney cancer or symptoms of kidney cancer? And, um, you know, is a radiation oncologist somebody that should be involved in, in the management of kidney cancer? So I think traditionally, um, the use of uh, radiation in kidney cancer, ha it hasn't been used much. Certainly when a, a newly diagnosed uh, person with kidney cancer where the kidney cancer has not spread. Um, and as you, you know, as we're all talking, um, you know, I'm privileged to work with my colleagues who are quite good at caring for people with kidney cancer and quite successful. However, there are situations where um, either the cancer spreads or the cancer comes back. And then that, and that's a situation where radiation can be quite effective. Um, and I think it's something we've been learning over the last couple of years where there's specific ways to do radiation not just for kidney cancer, but it is used in, in, in quite a bit in kidney cancer, where we can give very big doses of radiation to very small areas, either near the kidney um, or somewhere else that can control uh, a recurrent kidney cancer. Um, one of the things that radiation is quite good at is stopping bleeding. And this unfortunately happens more than we would like. Um, and there's many ways to control it, but that's a situation where radiation is actually quite good. Um, so, so radiation oncologists, we do have a part to play in the care for patients with kidney cancer, not always up front, but we're always available. And this gets back into the ability we're working together as a team because um, the uh, care for many cancers, it's multidisciplinary, meaning that um, you need to have more than one thing, surgery, systemic therapy, chemotherapy, some of the new immunotherapies and radiation. And for us where we're actually, we work together, we talk to each other, on a daily basis. Um, I think it's important even for us as physicians to know the different options are available so that if there's something comes up and we're like, hmm, not sure how to take care of this, wait a sec, let me talk with my colleague because there really are many ways to care for patients. Um, and so I think in that way for kidney cancer, this is where we, we come in as a radiation oncologist. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Kudukov, I have sort of a three part question um, for you. Uh, one is, uh, when you remove the bladder, which you can talk a little bit about for bladder cancer, why does the prostate uh, get removed as well in a man, obviously? And that's, that's sort of number one. This, the second part of that question is, I hear about lymph nodes being removed, and why do we do that? And, and finally, one of the questions that has come in from patients is about lymphedema. And uh, where does lymphedema occur? And can it occur anywhere in the legs? and sort of kind of like, how does that work? What causes it? And anything that can be done to prevent it? Great questions. So first about the prostate. 
A prostate is a gland that sits uh, basically around the urethra, okay? And it sits at the base of a man's bladder. Uh, and what's important to understand is that the inner lining of the bladder is the, really the same as the inner lining of the ureters, which are the tubes that run from the kidneys to the bladder and the inner lining of the kidneys. Um, and just like uh, Dr. Correa said, there are, can there are cancer. Some, once somebody has a urothelial carcinoma, we have to watch their upper tracts, their uh, kidneys and ureters really for the rest of their life, making sure that there's not a recurrence there. Well, the prostate is actually lined by urothelial as well. The, ure the urethra in the prostate has urothelial lining. So patients with bladder cancer are also at risk for uh, urothelial recurrence in their prostate. The prostate is removed for that reason, to control, um, to control disease, but also it's so intimately related to the bladder and its blood supply is so intimately related to the bladder that it's actually quite difficult to remove the bladder without removing the prostate um, and, and really not, and uh, without compromising cancer control. So that's, that's part of the reasons why we, we remove the prostate uh, almost always when we remove the bladder. Now, your other questions about lymph nodes. And uh, to answer that question, we sort of have to discuss um, what are lymph nodes in the first place. So lymph nodes, um, the lymphatic system is really a system that traffics the immune system, okay? It basically gets the, our immune cells to the right places in our body. And when patients have cancer, the, uh, the cancer can, some, can at times hijack this immune system and especially in bladder cancer, and actually in prostate cancer as well, this is uh, a mechanism for cancer to spread. It actually uh, hijacks the, 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 the uh, uh, lymph channels and it implants, the cancer cells implant in the lymph nodes. So at times, they're actually, these lymph nodes, if they're removed and they are filled with cancer, you could potentially be curative. So, the, the role of uh, lymph node dissection or lymph node removal during bladder cancer surgery is really twofold. One, it's diagnostic. It tells us where we stand and it tells us how far the disease has spread. And also, you know, although this is a little bit more controversial, there are some, some that believe that it's therapeutic as well, where you really can change people's destiny by taking out some of these lymph nodes that are involved and, um, and, and, and curing people by removing those lymph nodes. And, and what about this final question of lymphedema? Can, can, oh, yeah. Do you lymphedema. see lymphedema? Tell me about that. Yeah, so, so what is lymphedema? Lymphedema is basically removing uh, lymph nodes in, in places where all of a sudden the body can't uh, any longer um, sort of uh, have a free flow of lymph fluid in their swelling. So one of the common things that people really know about is in patients with breast cancer, when they have an axillary or uh, a lymph node dissection in the armpit, there, it's a common side effect for women to have lymphedema of their arm, which is a really debilitating side effect of uh, breast, cancer, uh, breast cancer surgery. Um, in, in sort of our general urinary world, we see lymphedema a lot for patients with penile cancers because we take lymph nodes out in the, in the groin and sort of where the fold of, uh, of the body, where the leg meets the body. In bladder cancer, we don't have to remove those lymph nodes. We're removing the lymph nodes in the deep pelvis. So lymphedema is actually a very, very unusual and rare occurrence. And it's not something that um, we, we worry about very much. Um, it does happen, but it happens usually for other reasons other than the lymph node removal, usually having to do with cancer spreading and those kind of rare instances. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in general, the patients who have a lymph node dissection in their pelvis really don't have to worry too much about lymphedema. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Zibelman, there's a question that came up. You, you talked about immunotherapy. You may not be aware, but I will ask. Are, are, have you heard of the new IL-2, the Elkhamer's clinical trial by chance, or, or sort of um, IL-2-like drugs? Do we use IL-2 anymore at, uh, for kidney cancer? Um, is there any role for that, the high-dose IL-2 that used to be used before? Sure, so high-dose IL-2 is a therapy <clears throat> that has been used in kidney cancer um, and can actually, for patients with metastatic kidney cancer, some small percent, probably about five to seven percent, can actually be cured despite having metastatic kidney cancer. 
Um, the difficulty with this therapy is it, it is very toxic, um, gets patients very sick, requires ICU level care, and really is has been um, used mostly at, at centers that do it a lot with very, very young, healthy patients who can tolerate what can be very toxic therapy. So I, I do think there is still a role for high dose IL-2 for a very small selection of patients, um, certain types of kidney cancers, young, healthy patients. Um, we do not offer high dose IL-2 um, at Fox Chase, um, um, but it is something that for the right patient um, may be worth considering. Um, however, we are trying to look at new ways to sort of use the idea or target um, IL-2. Um, this is a cytokine, basically a chemical signal in the body that the immune system uses, and to sort of hijack that approach and be able to offer similar therapy that's less toxic. And so there is a drug being studied in kidney cancer right now that um, basically uh, is similar to IL-2 but does not have the same um, level of toxic side effects. Um, it is still in clinical trials right now, and they're looking at it in phase two and phase three trials, but it's a promising drug for kidney cancer and hopefully something that we'll be able to, to talk about and offer to patients at some point in the future. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. You know, another question that came up is about a little bit of the side effects. And, you know, we talked about um, radiation uh, and chemotherapy being used for bladder cancer. And one of the questions that com came up is, um, what kind of side effects do we see with that? And is there a potential for some, frankly, bowel incontinence or urinary sort of issues as you use radiation? Uh, Dr. Hallman and, and Dr. Nari, maybe you can chime in and, uh, about chemotherapy that, that, that you use together. Do you guys see that at all? Well, uh, thanks, Dan. That's a good question. I'll, I'll yeah. talk a little bit about the radiation side effects. As you would imagine, when you deliver radiation therapy to the bladder, it does cause some irritation. Um, that being said, sometimes the tumors actually cause a lot of irritation as well. So what we often see is that the radiation will alleviate some of the irritation that's caused by the tumors. And this type of irritation can, um, can feel like a bladder infection where you just urinate more often, you have more urgency, meaning that you, you can't hold your urine quite as long as you usually would. You can get some burning with urination uh, along with that. Um, and when, as patients go through treatment for their bladder cancer, those are also some of the side effects of radiation. In the end, most patients will, those, those side effects will, will resolve as the, as the inflammation of the bladder resolves after radiation. Um, and, but those, those, are, those are typical side effects. The rectum is somewhat close to the bladder and the small bowel is above it, which is a portion of the intestines. And, and uh, that can also cause some loose stools and, and, and some side effects like that. But it's, it's less common that, that we see that in bladder radiation because we're focusing more of the radiation on the bladder itself. Um, again, that is typically something that resolves with time after patients have uh, recovered from the radiation treatment. We don't typically see bowel incontinence or you know, you know, soilage from, from stools uh, and things like that after radiation therapy. It's, you know, patients can have some alterations with looser stools that may be a little bit prolonged after radiation, but it usually recovers and you don't typically see bowel incontinence. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Nari, the chemotherapy that you use with, with, with uh, radiation or even in the new adjuvant uh, before surgery space, uh, do patients usually tolerate that okay and recover? Or what are some of the common side effects you see? And um, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the new drugs that we have. Uh, I've heard about infortimab uh, for example, uh, for the treatment of bladder cancer. So we use chemotherapy in the bladder cancer world, um, oftentimes before surgery, so in the neoadjuvant setting. The chemotherapy is pretty tough chemotherapy. Um, it can sometimes be difficult to tolerate, but what I tell all of my patients um, is that we give these drugs all the time. So these side effects are generally pretty predictable. And, and I think as a team, um, we do a really good job of getting people through it. So generally we give chemotherapy usually about three times before someone goes on to surgery or sometimes if someone elects not to go on undergo surgery before um, chemotherapy and radiation combined. Um, so we'll give that three times. And, and I always tell people the first cycle is a little bit of a learning curve where we find out exactly how you felt um, so that we can hopefully troubleshoot the second and third cycle um, even better and really tailor it to what each person experiences. Um, we know that common side effects of chemotherapy, it can affect blood counts, it can make people tired. 
Um, a lot of my patients will have taste changes. The chemotherapies that we use in bladder, we have to be careful in people who have um, underlying nerve issues or neuropathy or hearing loss because we know that um, one of the drugs that we very commonly use in bladder cancer caused dysplatin can, can affect the, uh, someone's hearing and, and someone's nerves. So those are um, some of the more common things. Uh, one of the biggest questions people ask me is nausea and vomiting. Um, and, and we have a lot of anti-nausea medicines we use before chemotherapy in the infusion room. And then we send people home with medicines that they can take by mouth at home. Um, so, so oftentimes, if someone does experience nausea, they're, they're able to control it with um, the medications that we give them. Some of the new medications that have been approved in bladder cancer, 2019 was a big year. We had two new medications approved. Um, one, like Dr. Guinesman mentioned, was uh, infortimab vidotin. It is a medicine called an antibody drug conjugate. So what that means is that there is a chemotherapy medicine that is linked almost to something like a homing device. So the medicine will go directly to the um, bladder cancer cells themselves and hopefully kill the bladder cancer cells without affecting the more normal healthy tissues in the body like traditional chemotherapy does. Um, so that is a new medicine that has um, really exciting results from uh, a phase two clinical trial that shows that people who have gotten traditional chemotherapy and immunotherapy um, still have excellent responses in, in later lines of treatment. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, certainly a, a lot of progress in both kidney and bladder cancer really over the last five years. You know, one area we haven't touched upon is I think something that uh, urologists see a whole lot of and medical oncologists uh, traditionally have not, although now are starting to, and that's non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So um, Dr. Correa, could you just sort of define that a little bit for us? And, and, and what, how do you separate non-muscle invasive bladder cancer from muscle invasive bladder cancer? And how, how are those patients treated? Yeah, thank you, Dennis. A very good question. So, yeah, the muscle, I tell my patients that the muscle is kind of in three main layers. The urothelial layer, that's where the cancer kind of forms. Then you have the lamina propria, which is like where the blood vessels and the lymphatics live that fit that urothelial layer, and then you have the muscle. So any cancer that invades or are in the two first layers is considered non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Now, the cancer also can come in two kind of fashions. There is the non-aggressive, what we call low-grade, and the aggressive that is called hydrate. So depending on where you are there, then the cancer can, these cancers tend to recur, but some of them can be dangerous. So especially the high grade and the ones that invade into the second layer, the lamina propria, can eventually progress into then invading into the lamina and to then into the muscle. And for those, we tend to do more aggressive therapies like putting installations in the blood or either be it through BCG or chemotherapy agents. And, and, um is there a role for immunotherapy now in non-muscle invasive um, bladder cancer? Um, I don't know if Dr. Gatali or Dr. Zibelman, um, have you treated patients with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer with sort of this modern immunotherapy like uh, Keytruda? Um, yeah, the non, there is role for immunotherapy in patients with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer uh, based on a recent approval by the FDA. Uh, it's usually given to patients who uh, are refractory to BCG, which is one of the treatments that is given in the bladder. Um, and in, if patients have recurrent tumors developing after uh, having receiving BCG or intravesical therapy inside the bladder, then for those patients, uh, we usually recommend removal of the bladder. However, uh, in cases where that is absolutely not an option, uh, Immunotherapy is uh, currently something that can be used um, and uh, based on the approval. Yep. Mm. And, and Dr. Kudukov, let me ask you, what, what, is there stuff that's new on the horizon for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer? Are there exciting clinical trials or approaches um, that you've heard of or you know, are thinking about or talking about with your colleagues? Yeah, there's... Um... There's a drug that's immediately on the horizon, um, which hasn't been approved for, by the FDA, so I probably shouldn't talk about it just yet, but uh, it went through um, clinical trials. Uh, it, it's been reported in, in, um, in the literature, 
And it, it's, it, you know, it, it's an incremental step forward. It's, it's really uh, just like the immunotherapy uh, strategy. It's um, uh, an approach uh, to offer patients an alternative to cystectomy for those who have failed um, BCG therapy. Um, what also we're doing a lot at Fox Chase is um, a novel treatment, and uh, we have one of the largest series, I believe, uh, in the country at this point, um, is uh, using a combination of chemotherapy, uh, but intravesical chemotherapy, giving chemotherapy into the bladder, and this is a combination of gemcitabine and docetaxel, um, uh, especially on a maintenance course where you give, I actually saw just a patient just a few hours ago um, where he was refractory just about to everything else and it really is not a great cystectomy candidate and um, we gave him an induction of uh, uh, gem site, uh, you know, we would call gem dosi, gem cytomine dosi taxel and uh, we just celebrated maybe the first cystoscopy since I've met him that didn't have a tumor in there and this is a rapidly, uh, patient with rapidly recurrent disease that just in every three month interval, regardless of how thorough the uh, transurethral resection was, he would have a new tumor through BCG, through mitomycin, through just about everything we tried. And here's, uh, you know, gem dosi where you see uh, just a remarkable um, response. And uh, these patients, a lot of the times actually get a monthly uh, installation of this combination. It's not given in a lot of centers. It takes, uh, it's, a, it's sort of a much more burdensome uh, therapy to receive since it's, you know, it's given in the bladder. You have to instill one agent, then uh, wait for an hour, then come back and have the catheter replaced and put another agent. So mm -hmm. it's uh, quite a laborious process for the, you know, for the treatment team, but also, you know, sort of a, a, a huge ordeal for the patients to go through. But uh, sort of a, it's, it really is a nice strategy to offer patients uh, uh, that are looking down the barrel of cystectomy and don't have muscle invasive disease. Yeah, you know, I think as a medical oncologist, I've shared a number of patients with you guys who, who've been getting a gem dose text. I can think of one in particular, uh, share with Dr. Ruzzo, who's, who's had a response after not having a response to a number of other therapies, uh, including uh, immunotherapy. Um, Dr. Ruzzo, is, is this sort of a difficult combination to, to deliver? Is this what you're thinking about a lot um, now here at Fox Chase? And What's your experience been or any thoughts you have on non-muscle invasive bladder cancer? Well, our, our goal is to not remove the bladder. You know, nobody wants their bladder removed. It's a complicated operation. And even if you can make a new bladder, it's not, never as good as your God-given bladder. So anything we can do. That said, we also have to realize that bladder cancer, if it progresses, is incurable. So we're always walking this fine line between you know, trying to save the bladder and trying to not allow the cancer to progress. So this is a huge area of research right now. What else can we put in the bladder or what else can we give patients to try to get rid of the tumor before it gets into the deeper layers of the bladder? And I've been using this gemcitabine docetaxel now for about five, four or five years, uh, actually for, you know, salvage, what we say, uh, therapy after we've tried other options. And I've had some very, very good success stories with it. Now, there's lots of things coming out through drug companies all the time. Dr. Kudakoff mentioned, you know, one is on the uh, horizon very soon. And, but this is where clinical trials take place. You know, this is patients often will get these therapies well before they're available, you know, uh, to the general public. And many times, you know, when you do that, you sort of not only advance science, but you also help yourself hopefully to save your bladder. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm cognizant of time, um, and um, I, I want to sort of go around and uh, ask one more time each of you, um, in bladder cancer and kidney cancer, um, any parting thoughts? Where have we been? Where are we going? Uh, and, and really, why Fox Chase? And, and how's Fox Chase been involved in that progress, really, in... Uh, genitourinary malignancies, uh, especially given that a number of you here on the Zoom call have really been leaders of, of clinical trials and progress uh, in, in this area. So um, I, I know it's hard when there's multiple people and, and, and by the time you get to, to the end, but um, we just like to hear that. So maybe um, I'll start uh, with you, Dr. Horowitz, um, your perspective. 
I mean, what I think is like looking back over my career, I've seen the changes since the mid 1990s and just one, just how many good ways there are to treat patients with both bladder cancer and kidney cancer um, that just didn't exist before. And then for the treatments that we have, you know, because I always think it's a balance between you obviously want to cure a person if possible and you want them to experience as few side effects as possible. And we can minimize side effects or we can manage side effects far more effectively than we used to. And I've seen that just over the years. I think that's one of the biggest deals. Um, and then just to be able to work with experts, you know, our, my, my peers are all of you. I think it really makes a difference of how we care for people. And I just think it just, it, it helps. It just, it, you know, to be able to work with ex experts across the board. Um, yeah, absolutely. Dr. Ruzzo, what are your thoughts? Well, I'll I'll just say that, you know, it has really been sort of monumental changes in the care of patients with kidney and bladder cancer in the last decade. I know that that's not good enough. I know we've got a long way to go, but it is amazing when you see people respond and they respond, you know, for long periods of time. And, you know, you see tumors that, you know, were never curable without removing the the, the organ that just go away or that, you know, sort of get so much smaller and just stay sitting there and you know, I have to say that, you know, I, I mean, I think we used to talk about it in the 90s that, you know, the future was just around the corner and hopefully that we, we thought that was the case. But I mean, there is nothing hotter in medicine right now than sort of try these new advanced therapies, moving away from chemotherapy, saving organs that used to come out, you know, and, and really sort of getting these wonderful responses, you know, that we could only have dreamed about five or 10 years ago. So you know, I guess what I'd say is I'm incredibly encouraged about what the future looks like, you know, in the next even one or two or three years. I mean, there's stuff coming up so quickly that you just can hardly even keep track of it all because it just comes at you so quick. But that's why we have each other here. And that's what this team offers. It, it offers that constancy of expertise. Uh, and, and, and I think that um, when patients come here, that's what they benefit from. Yeah, absolutely. The data certainly is flying quick. Dr. Dr. Kudakov, what are your thoughts? Yes, I, you know, I echo what's been said. I think, you know, I think what we have at Fox Chase is we have sort of a combination of a couple of things. So one, we have the expertise. We have all the available tools, right? We have all the latest um, uh, medical oncology, uh, therapeutics, uh, we have the clinical trials that patients may not get somewhere anywhere else. Um, we have, uh, you know, world-class uh, radi radiation oncology expertise, especially, you know, in um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Horowitz and Dr. Hallman. Uh, for instance, for our bladder cancer patients, I'd just like to give them a plug. I, I don't know anybody in the region that's really delivers uh, bladder cancer radiotherapy with the skill and precision that this team does. Um, the horror stories that uh, patients ask about with radiating bladders and being bladder cripples just doesn't happen here. And we radiate lots of bladders. And uh, just the way this, the, the, this radiation is delivered is, is just tremendous here. And, you know, for surgery, listen, uh, you know, we have one of the premier uh, urologic oncology fellowships here. And the reason why uh, trainees come to train with us is because we uh, pride ourselves on being modality agnostic. What does that mean? All of our surgeons can operate with a knife, which is traditional open surgery, with a laparoscope, which is keyhole incisions, and robotically. And you know, I'm very fortunate to have been trained uh, in such a way and to practice in such a way where I can honestly sit in front of a patient and just give them the best operation, not the one that uh, you know, I'm most comfortable with. So whereas at some institution, you have an open surgeon, you have a robotic surgeon, here you have a urological oncologist. A modern urological oncologist should be able to uh, provide any surgical modality and provide one that applies the best to that patient. Now, we have all the expertise, but what we also have is, and I always sort of tell the, tra tell the trainees, is, you know, decisions are more important than incisions, right? We have this, we, we have this collaboration where we get together, we discuss the cases, you see all of us. And we also partner with the patients. You know, I, I, I had a patient, you know, re recently where, you know, I, I sort of was very much taken aback that we didn't offer them something that we usually offer. And, you know, I looked back at my notes and we, 
um, you, you know, just the way they presented, it kind of shifted me one way, but as, as we did more procedures and we got more information, they definitely were a great candidate for another modality. And they brought it to us and we offered them the modality. And, you know, and, and the patients are really uh, a full partner in, in these decisions. And, uh, and I think that why it's, why it's, why this team works and why it's successful. We're open to other clinicians' opinions, but we also welcome our patients to sort of turn to us and say, but what about, what about trying this? And, you know, what, what do you think about this? And I, I think all of us are very much open to that. Absolutely. Dr. Anari, um, what do you love about being an oncologist? One of my favorite parts about being an oncologist is, I guess there's really two things that I love. I love the close relationships that you get with patients and their families because you're with people during the hardest times in their lives. I think COVID has really thrown a wrench in things. And one of the, um, one of the things I've tried to do in my practice is virtual visits. So video visits that when you talk to people, they could be surrounded by their loved ones um, so that you really keep everyone really involved and everyone feels as though they have their support systems with them. Uh, in-person visits can sometimes be a challenge because of the restrictions to keep our staff and our patients safe. So I'll also encourage people to um, FaceTime or join in via, via speakerphone so that we can keep everyone really in the loop. So again, I think having people's families um, with them is really critical to help with decision-making and just, just to have their loved ones with them. And from a professional side, my favorite part about being an oncologist is working in a multidisciplinary team. Um, I think one of the reasons why I love Fox Chase is that you have that major academic center feel, but it's a really close knit family. And um, that's probably my favorite part about going to work every day is knowing that I can pick up the phone and, and call any one of you um, to discuss a patient or, or any issues that are going on. Dr. Hallman? Any, any cool trials, clinical trials in, in radiation oncology that, 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 that are happening right now that, that you're excited about? Well, yeah, so, so um, I have to give credit to, to our, our department chair, Dr. Harwitz, um, but we have uh, uh, something called a, a microtron, which we're using mm. to uh, basically adapt photodynamic therapy to what we call radiodynamic therapy, where we uh, use a, a sensitizer uh, and this special type of linear accelerator that delivers radiation to hopefully activate the sensitizer um, to kill cancer cells throughout um, different areas of the body and take radiation oncology and make it more, instead of a local therapy similar to surgery, treat larger areas of the body more similar to chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an exciting new thing that we have. And, and um, you know, it's a project that the center has been working on. Um, again, credit goes to Dr. Harwitz. There's um, some old technologies that we're using in new ways um, as well. Stereotactic body radiation therapy, which is the focused high doses of radiation. We've been successful in treating patients that have had kidney tumors, for example, spread to other areas of the body. So for example, small lung nodule, we can deliver radiation therapy to those areas and get good responses. And, and a previously incurable disease is now controlled well for many years. And these patients uh, really do well with that. So so those are some of the advances that I've seen and even in my relatively shorter career here at Fox Chase that we're, we're all excited about. Dr. Zibelman, uh, what do you love about being a researcher, a clinical researcher, you know, someone who's involved in, in clinical trials? We talk a lot about clinical trials and one of the reasons why, you know, coming to Fox Chase may make a difference. What's your sense and take on that? I mean, so I think clinical trials is is one of the best things that um, I get to play a part of at Fox Chase, um, both being able to offer great new therapies and new combinations to to our patients, uh, and also just the, the the science of it and being able to sort of um, learn about and and study new therapies that might improve the care that that we're we're able to offer. Um, I think one of the exciting, exciting things, I'll, I'll give a shout out to Dr. Guinesman because he's had to run this whole thing and hasn't gotten to speak, but he was a uh, leader of a great um, trial that we, we had um, looking at ways to look at biomarkers that might predict patients who would respond to chemotherapy with bladder cancer and possibly be able to not move on to uh, having their bladder removed. And so I think that's a, a, um, a really exciting trial to not only improve care, but to um, spare people patients um, having to have their bladder removed. And so we're, we're excited to be able to offer that to patients 
some of whom I know were, were participating in this event tonight um, and you know might hopefully show it makes a difference for patients with bladder cancer. And so those are the kinds of trials that I think we, um, we love to be a part of and, and it's been a, a great uh, blessing to be a, at Fox Chase and be able to have that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Correa, why do you love being a urologist and a urologic oncologist? You, you could have stayed in general urology, you could have done general surgery. Why, why urologic oncology? Why is it so cool? Uh, no, I think that um, when, um, the nice thing about urology is the fact that you get to deal with uh, not only the surgical part of the urological system, but also the medical part. So I see a lot of patients with just urology issues and either be because of difficulty urinating or they have issues in the genitalia and stuff like that. Um, that part of general urology is fascinating and actually very fun to take care of patients. Um, the oncology side is, um, you, as Dr. Anari mentioned, you're meeting patients in kind of the lowest moment when people get told they have cancer. Sometimes it's very, very scary. And I think that nowadays, the expertise that we bring to the table and be able to ease the patient, again, you're not going to cure the disease when you meet you, but you're able to give them some knowledge and information about their cancer and give them that information, at least appeases some of the concerns they have and gives them guidance and, in a way, a compass so they can navigate this issue either with you or one of our, any of our colleagues. Um, uh, there's a little thing about Fox Chase. I think that um, I was an institution before here, and I think that somebody that was mentioned here is that kind of the unsung heroes of our um, center is actually the nursing staff, the schedulers, and the people in radiology and stuff like that. Um, in my other center, you could see people that were just churning through the center, new nurses and stuff like that. And I think when you walk through Fox Chase, there are people that have had their careers here and people that care and know how to take care of these patients. So I think that that's a tremendous asset that we have here that the nurses here that know more about urology than I do, just because they've been doing it longer. And so they're tremendous assets when it comes to that. And I think that I'm very lucky to work with them. Yeah, wonderful. And finally, Dr. Gatalia, um, wonderful clinician and, and, and researcher, and you're submitting grants. And uh, any, any parting thoughts from you and uh, sort of vision for the, for the future here of, of, of generative urinary malignancies at Fox Chase? Yeah. Um... I think one of the key questions as we are making such great advances in this field is trying to understand why some patients respond to treatments and other patients don't. And really trying to understand why is it that some patients do not. And uh, that's uh, an area where uh, myself and a lot of other people in this group uh, have invested a lot of their efforts. Um, and I, 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 see, I see that as a uh, um, you know, one of the questions, once it's answered, it'll take the field to another level. Uh, you know, uh, Fox Chase is uh, just a wonderful place, uh, you know, not, not just because patients receive excellent care, it's a, it's a cancer center, and everyone knows uh, how, to, how to deal with patients who are going through some of the roughest times of their lives. Uh, and also uh, just wonderful people to work with. Uh, that's why, um, you know, I have stayed here and I will continue to stay here. Yeah. Well, you know, let me just say, you know, it, it's been a privilege for me to work with everyone um, on, on this call. Um, and I would echo everything that everyone said. It's been a wonderful uh, opportunity. And I think just our discussion here today uh, confirms that and underscores that, the collegiality and the thoughtfulness of it. Um, so let me, let me close uh, today by just thanking again all the exhibitors, and I, I want to name them because they're an important part of progress, uh, and, and that's Bristol-Myers Squibb, Keras Life Science, Foundation Medicine, Genentech, Garden Health, Natera, Oncosec, Tempest, and Eurogen, ESI, Exelix, Sanofi, Genzyme, Seattle Genetics, and our uh, partner, Beacon. Uh, as Dr. Uzo mentioned before, uh, progress would be really impossible, I think, without you. So thank you very much. And I really want to thank the patients. Um, this is a recorded event. Um, and we really hope to see you in person soon. Uh, we'd be happy to answer any follow-up questions. Uh, call us, email us. As, as you all know, we're, we're always available. Uh, and I want to thank, of course, all the panelists, Dr. Zibelman, Dr. Kudikov, Horowitz, Gatalia. Palman, Anari, Korea, and Uzo for just taking the time. Uh, it, it, means, it means a lot. And um, good night and, and take care.